Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So if you're new here, today I'm going to be talking about RU58841 and on this channel in general I talk about hair loss related content. But anyway, today I'd like to delve into the human clinical trial data on the topic of the anti-androgen RU58841, which was seemingly abandoned after phase one and phase two human clinical trials in the early 2000s. So as some of you may know, I've been trying to look for these phase one and phase two human clinical trials, which I'll put on the screen right now. And my journey began with tracing RU58841's development trajectory, developed by Rousseau Rupleff, and then acquired through a series of mergers and acquisitions, finally being clinically trialed by Prostracken, a UK-based pharmaceutical company. And later, Prostracken was absorbed and bought by Kiowa Kirin, a Japanese pharmaceutical company. And these two specific human clinical trials, each with its own focus and methodology, piqued my interest and curiosity. The first phase, conducted by Dr. Evelyn Gunoli, I think that's her name, and it took place in France, was a meticulously designed, double-blind, randomized, vehicle-controlled study. It focused on the safety and tolerance of a 5% topical solution of RU58841, also known as PSK3841 solution. And it was mainly in a population of Caucasian males aged between 18 and 50 who were grappling with androgenetic alopecia. And this study was conducted for over four weeks and employed a twice daily administration of topical 5% RU58841 or PSK3841. Same drug, different names. Now, it seems as if it was safe enough because they went on to phase two. The second phase was led by a Dr. Dominique Van Nest in Belgium and also the UK. It took the form of a multi-center double blind randomized vehicle controlled study spanning six months. This trial aimed to quantitatively estimate hair regrowth in male subjects utilizing two ethanolic PSK3841, again another name for RU58841, solutions at concentrations of 2.5% and 5%. The underlying hypothesis anticipated a significant increase in hair growth and the safe and well-tolerated applications of the treatment. Now, despite the well-documented setup and execution of these trials, the results and subsequent conclusions remain unknown because they haven't been published to the public in over 20 years. So eager for answers, I reached out to Kiowa Kirin, the pharmaceutical company that acquired Prostracken that was doing the clinical trials of RU58841, aka PSK3841. So at first I emailed them, I didn't get a response, and then I actually called them and I was considering driving to their Princeton, New Jersey location because they have an office in Princeton, New Jersey. And I thought if I were able to get a, you know, more human, close to close, one-on-one -on -one contact, I'd be able to get the message across of what I was looking for exactly. But I called them, they pushed up, and I was able to reach a representative. In return, I received a courteous yet perplexing reply. I got this letter and I'll put it on the screen. I won't read it word for word, but you can look at it essentially for those who are not looking at the screen. The letter referencing my inquiry informed me that Kiowa Kirin had halted the development of RU58841 over a decade ago and that it had never been marketed, but we already knew that. The lamentable absence of further information about the product or its clinical trials presented an unforeseen dead end. Their communication, while professional and considerate, offered no additional insights into why the development was halted after phase one and phase two human clinical trials. Now, granted, I never mentioned anything about the specific papers names, like the specific clinical trial names, because I assumed that if I went in and told them about this particular compound, that they would be able to find it within their archives. And clearly, by the response from Kiowa Kirin, they knew of the existence and they knew that they were doing clinical research on it, but they had no further offering in terms of the clinical trial data. So recently, and by recently, I mean October 11th, 2023, I tried contacting their Princeton, New Jersey offices here in the United States. This time, I thought it would be apt to include the names of the researchers and the human clinical trial paper titles. As of this video's publication, I'm still waiting for their response. To be honest with you, all we can truly base our understandings on the safety and efficacy of RU58841 or PSK3841 is the clinical trial data regarding stump-tailed macaques, a primate species that, like humans, also have androgenetic alopecia. Animal studies and models are not perfect as they don't represent human biology. 
especially concerning dose and metabolism. However, stump-tailed macaques are more similar to humans than anything like a rat model would show us. So if we are to make any sort of assumptions or any sort of close ballpark theories, looking at this primate, this, this monkey, the stump-tailed macaques that do in nature have androgenetic alopecia, I think we can come to some rough conclusions about what it could have shown those particular papers. And before I even get into those papers, if you look at Prochtraken's earlier website talking about a topical anti-androgen that they're in clinical trials for, they talked about how it showed comparable hair growth in, I think it was a subject count of 90 individuals, it showed comparable hair growth to finasteride. So we do have an idea that at least when it comes to the biological understandings of androgenetic alopecia and RU58841, that it does offer some protection against DHT. But nevertheless, let's look at the research and see what it says about stump-tailed macaques and how RU58841 interacts with their hair follicles as well as their overall biology, like serum, testosterone levels, whether or not it does go systemic or presents any sort of toxic factors to the primate body. So without further ado, let's look at these particular papers. This study titled, quote, Dose-Dependent and Long-Term Effects of RU58841, Androgen Receptor Blocker on Hair Growth in Bald Stump-Tailed Macaques, unquote, was conducted by Hideo Uno et al. and published in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology in 1997. The researchers utilized a macaque model of androgenetic alopecia to explore the impacts of RU58841 on hair growth, particularly focusing on the frontal bald scalp. Solutions of RU58841 at varying concentrations of 5%, 3%, 1%, and 0.5%, along with a vehicle, were topically applied to different groups of monkeys daily for the duration of six months. Some monkeys were also subjected to continuous treatment for 12 to 24 months to scrutinize long-term effects. Notably, the results from the 5% RU58841 concentration group exhibited a significant enhancement in hair density, thickness, and length after merely three months of treatment, with the phototrichogram analysis indicating a two- to three-fold increase in the population of hair follicles enlarged to terminal size and in the antigen phase at the fifth month. Contrastingly, the 3% solution demonstrated a modest effect in only one case while the impact of 1% and 0.5% solutions were markedly weaker. In terms of long-term effects, all cases in the 5% group displayed consistent hair and follicular growth from 3 to 7 months, which sustained as long as the treatment persisted. However, hair loss was observed after 3 months post-withdrawal in all cases. The 0.5% group did not exhibit further progression beyond the initial minimal effects of the long-term study. This research underlines the potential of RU58841, particularly at a 5% concentration, to significantly promote hair and follicular regrowth given that the treatment is maintained. And this is why I find topical anti-androgens so fascinating, because if we are able to get a proper one that is proven with human clinical trial data, like hopefully pyrolitamide, also known as KX826, then it could be potentially used in place of a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Now, in my opinion, I think if we do get a topical anti-androgen for androgenetic alopecia that comes to market, if we do get that, I still think that we should be using 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride or dutasteride because one, I do think these things will cost a pretty penny, it will be expensive, but also I don't think you can cover your entire scalp, especially for people who are more diffuse thinners. So I think a dual therapy of a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and a topical antiandrogen would suffice. But yes, that was that study. Let's go on to another study in another paper titled, quote, the evaluation of RU58841 as an antiandrogen in the prostate of PC3 cells and a topical anti-alopecia agent in the bald scalp of stump-tailed macaques, unquote. Quite a long title. But in this paper, it mentions how the examination for possible systemic effects of topical RU58841 in the treatment group showed no detectable abnormalities, and the treatment group would be those stump-tailed macaque monkeys. 
researchers could not find any sort of detectable abnormalities in body weight, hematology, and blood chemistry tests, as well as serum levels of testosterone and DHT, as well as luteinizing hormone. So in other words, when using RU58841 on stump-tailed macaques, the evidence did not show a significant impact on testosterone and dihydrotestosterone levels, as well as other blood markers and hormone markers as well. So this suggests that RU58841 may have been, if it went to market, may have been a reliable treatment. But again, we have to worry about things like the vehicle or the mechanism in which this drug is being delivered, because if it's using some sort of special type of delivery system that prevents RU58841 from going fully systemic, then maybe that's something that we have to look into. But from my understanding of my research, it seems as if it's just um, ethanol and RU58841 dissolved into it. Now, there are other studies that explore the use of liposomes with RU58841, but I'm not going to be talking about that in this particular video. So let's go on to the next paper. This is just an interesting paper I thought that I would include for those worried about scalp testosterone, because people like to rage on about that a lot. So a paper titled, quote, Inhibition of Hair Growth by Testosterone in the Presence of Dermal Papilla Cells from the Frontal Bald Scalp of the post-pubertal stump-tailed macaque, unquote, by Noriko Obana et al., explores the inhibitory effects of testosterone and hair growth, specifically focusing on the interaction between testosterone and dermal papilla cells in the frontal bald scalp of post-pubertal stump-tailed macaques. The researchers draw attention to the relationship between testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and the regression of hair follicles focusing particularly on post-puberty phase when the elevation of these hormones are observed. One intriguing aspect presented by the authors is that testosterone in isolation does not impact the proliferation of the dermal papilla cells or outer root sheath cells when these cells are cultured independently. So essentially, when you take these hair follicles and put it in a petri dish and you expose it to, to testosterone, it's not preventing these hair follicles from growing any hair. However, when co-cultured, especially with dermal papilla cells derived from the bald scalps of adult macaques, testosterone is observed, seemingly observed, to inhibit or kind of restrict hair growth out of these hair follicles. And this is likely due to those scalps having a high presence of 5-alpha reductase. Now, again, like I mentioned in many other videos, but DHT is a paracrine hormone, which means it is produced at the site of a particular tissue. So when testosterone is floating around in the body, it comes in contact with this enzyme that's in a particular tissue, and then that enzyme being 5-alpha reductase turns testosterone into DHT. So in the scalp of these adult balding macaques, they had a high presence of 5-alpha reductase, which converted testosterone into DHT, which ultimately caused that suppressive side effect of hair miniaturization, eventually balding, and yeah, you crying about losing your hair. Obana at also explored the role of RU58841, an androgen receptor blocker, and observed its antagonistic effects on testosterone-induced inhibition of cell proliferation. Moreover, the study indicates that RU58841 demonstrated a significant impact on hair regrowth in bald frontal scalp of stump-tailed macaque monkeys. Supporting the in vitro culture studies that suggest that antiandrogens can counteract DHT-elicited growth inhibition. So what are my final thoughts in all of this? Well, from the publicly available clinical data and studies involving the closely related stump-tailed macaque monkeys, and by closely related, I mean they're closely related to us humans, RU58841 demonstrates seemingly little to no systemic absorption. It's noteworthy that these monkeys are smaller than the average human, so consequently, it is plausible that they were exposed to a significantly higher dose than what might be required for humans. However, the relevance of this dosing and conversion is uncertain, especially considering that a 5% RU58841 solution was observed to significantly promote the development of terminal hair growth from a vellus and smaller hair state to that larger, you know, antigen hair, that thick hair that you can actually see. And also, when you look at the human clinical trials that were performed, at least what we have evidence of, they do involve using that 5% topical RU58841 solution, also known as PSK3841. 
Therefore, based on the premise and speaking from a non-medical, non-doctor perspective, just my opinion, right guys? I would posit that RU58841 exhibits certain safety characteristics. And by that I mean, we know about not going fully systemic and stump-tailed macaques and it not having a significant impact on testosterone and DHT. It is conceivable that it is safe. It's, it doesn't have any sort of toxic sort of properties from what we can see, right? And in order for us to make a full observation, we really do need those phase one and phase two human clinical trial studies. Because who's to say that phase two was dropped because maybe people were getting hurt by RE58841? Because there is a presence of people online that complain about heart problems, but to my knowledge, there isn't any sort of literature that suggests topical antiandrogens causing heart issues. But that being said, we do need to see those phase one and phase two human clinical trial data points. Now, I want to say this, RU58841 is an experimental treatment. It has never been marketed. It's not even FDA approved. So when you're trying to purchase this for your research subject, you have to realize, depending on where you get it from, can directly impact the quality of the particular compound. And by that, what I'm trying to say is, you could be getting something that isn't even RU58841. You could be getting a metabolite of RU58841. You could be getting scammed and just getting like sugar. For all you know, you could be getting clear powder or something completely unrelated. A lot of these so-called gray market laboratories, these clandestine laboratories that make RU58841 solutions, you have to be careful because one, there is no sort of oversight that can see how these solutions are being standardized and produced. And two, you're really, you know, you have to trust these gray market places that you may be purchasing RU58841 for your research subject. It could be the case that you're not actually getting a particular concentration that is advertised. Let's say 5%, you may be getting 0.5% because sometimes people mess up on the math and the scales and they screw up. So if it's not working for you, at least to me, all the clinical trial data that's been done on stump-tailed macaques also, from what Prostrakin has mentioned on their website regarding the phase one study, and I'll put a screenshot over here about that. You can use the Wayback Machine link in the description to go see it for yourself. It does mention that they did observe noticeable increases of hair comparable to individuals that take finasteride. So we have all this animal model data, particularly from a very close relative, and we also have data or loosely have data about it working in human beings. So people that complain that it doesn't work, I mean, where are you getting your RU58841 from? That's a good question. Are you getting it from Alibaba where you can, for some crazy reason, you can somehow get a thousand grams of RU58841 for like a hundred dollars, which is absolute trash. It's a lie. It's not real. You're probably getting something else, right? This is why people have to be careful when they're trying to purchase these experimental topical or anything experimental that hasn't been FDA approved. Because it's not even just about the safety, it's about the reliability of the solution that you're buying, right? And because these companies operate in some sort of shady-like way, you know, they don't really have to be honest with what they're giving you. They can screw up on a couple of orders, they can screw up on a couple of batches and recover and, you know, deliver a, a good batch the next season. And for all you know, um, it, it wouldn't even impact their sales. There's a degree of they don't have to be transparent and they don't really have to tell you the full truth. So with that being said, yes, I think RU58841 is efficacious when it comes to regrowing your hair. Whether or not it's really safe for you to use, whether or not it does go systemic in human beings remains to be seen. But at least from our closest relative, when it comes to androgenetic alopecia, these stump-tailed macaque monkeys, it does seem that there is no impact from, at least from the literature, there is no impact on serum testosterone, serum DHT, and other hormones and hematological uh, blood data points. So that's my opinion on it. Thank you guys for watching this video. And hopefully, hopefully with the effort that I, that I give, I'm able to get those phase one and phase two human clinical trials. And I'm able to present it here one day on this channel. Hopefully we get those papers from Kiowa Kiran. But yeah. Also, as a bit of a side note, I'm working on another video. It's called Androgenetic Alopecia is a Disorder or a Disease. I haven't decided how the title will be, but hopefully I'll be able to get that to you guys shortly. But anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you got to the end of this video, comment in the comment section below. Are you fairy?
Yes, the Are You Fairy. Like, you know those little mystical fairy creatures? Well, we're going to have the Are You Fairy as a mascot. So, the Are You Fairy is this little mystical fairy creature that every night when you're sleeping, she comes by and she sprinkles some Are You 5841 powder on your head so it can, can start growing some hair again. So, anyway. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. See you on the next video. Peace.